you also spoke about how uh, the Fed is supposed to be overseeing banks. And um, take us through that role of theirs and especially how that relates to what we saw uh, around a month ago, I guess, at this point with the collapse of those two regional, I say in quotes, giant mm -hmm. banks that were redefined as regional uh, under the Trump administration to allow them to, to take on more risk. Yeah, I mean, I the, in general, the Fed is also put, supposed to have a major role in financial regulation. Um, it does not do this role very well. Uh, in practice, um, the Federal Reserve Board has technically been legally given this responsibility, but it delegates its role to the reserve banks, um, you know, the regional reserve banks. There are 12 of them. They have a president uh, that, you know, that is selected. That's a whole other conversation. But th these like reserve branch presidents, the president and CEOs of essentially like a big company. It's a public company, but a big company nonetheless. They're paid five hundred thousand dollars or sometimes even more than that. Um, and in, in, for example, the New York Fed. And it's just they, they were involved with so many responsibilities that. It's really like pick and choose which agent, which of those reserve banks take their regulatory role seriously, which means, you know, the kind of neglect of that role uh, goes downhill. And this has been a huge issue. It's a huge issue for decades. There was a, a vice, a commission run by vice, then Vice President George H.W. Bush, which was going to recommend uh, completely taking uh, regulatory super board, supervisory authority from the Federal Reserve, give it to other agencies that was killed at the last minute. Um, it's been it's it's been a recurrent problem that they're not very good regulators. Timothy Geithner very famously said that when he was at the New York Fed, he quote unquote wasn't a regulator, mm. and that was not true. But that that attitude of basically. Um, people being so neglectful of the role that they don't even think of themselves as regulators at all, um, it, it kind of permeates the history of this institution. And we almost took away all that power from the from the Fed, the, that supervisory power. And I think taking that power away from the Fed uh, is, should be under consideration again, especially for the institutions that aren't the largest institutions and thus don't have the specific Dodd-Frank rules um, involved them. Uh, whether or not we extend the Dodd-Frank rules to banks that would be the size of Silicon Valley Bank, which, of course, has been a big discussion. Yeah, I mean, and and if you don't mind speaking a bit more about the yeah. Fed and their response there, because I think a lot of people were confused when Janet Yellen said, hey, we're going to make depositors whole, but don't worry, it's not coming out of the uh the the taxpayers pockets and so that was like the treasury and the fed working together on this front um explain to the audience what the heck even happened at the, there yeah so um what you don't mind <laughs> this whole language of taxpayer money is a kind of it's a dodge um it's not really a very coherent concept on, an, on its own um there's always public money involved when you have some government agency handing over public money um in this case, what effectively happened is the, the immediate thing that happened is this: the Federal Reserve lent those well, those banks that were then now owned by the FDIC uh, literally like $150 billion to cover the depositor outflow that they couldn't cover before the FDIC took them over. So that's the most basic thing that happened. Um, and then at a certain point, the, um, some weeks later, uh, the bank was sold at a $20 billion loss, a $20 billion loss that was a loss taken by the government. Um, and that came out of the Depositor Insurance Fund, which is uh, from the FDIC, but it's basically just like an accounting gimmick. It's just, a, it's just a line item that says, you know, how much have we paid out versus how much have we specifically collected from banks in these uh, insurance assessments. Um, but essentially w what that's kind of just detail that can be swept aside. What happened was all first $150 billion were lent, and then ultimately $20 billion actually came from public money permanently, as in not a loan, just sort of this is what we're putting out there to backstop, uh, ultimately backstop depo uh, depositors and the losses that uh, the bank took. I mean, that's the basic, you know, right. down, uh, line is that you know, the public lost $20 billion in Silicon. Yeah. I mean, and, and it it just 
I, to, to return to your other point about the Fed and its failure uh, as a regulator, so much of this probably falls on the fact that Congress has been actively deregulating, deregulating the banks statutorily over the past, I mean, really since the Clinton administration. There has, Dodd-Frank, yes, was a, a, a bit of a, uh, a, a better step uh, in response to the, to the crash. They had to do something, but it didn't go far enough. And so it's almost like the Fed is taking on more than it should, given its role, because it, it, it's forced to kind of fill the gaps um, of what should be a legislative regulatory framework that is passed on to other bodies that are well more equipped for this. Yeah, I mean, I would say two things there. One is um, something that isn't really understood very well is that when Congress passes a law taking away regulatory authority from some agency, um, even if it's a specific set of authorities and not all of that authorities, th there's an implicit message that banking regulators take from that, which is we're supposed to stay away from that. We're going to get in trouble with Congress. We're going to get punished if we focus on that. So no matter how much the, the a deregulation that's happened, um, bank regulators take that as an even larger singular uh, signal to not supervise banks, to wow. de-supervise, okay. not focus on them. So deregula deregulation bills are always even worse than they seem on the top end because the, the message that it's regulators are effect. getting is, yeah, yeah, it's a chilling effect. You're not supposed to be looking at them at all. It's the same thing as like having a meeting with, you know, with the with with the Keating five over. You're not supposed to be regulating the Keating five. You know, if you didn't have the kind of people like Bill Black who are then going to blow the whistle, the alternative is, well, we're not supposed to really be looking at any of these savings and loans, you know, because we're going to get pulled up in a congressional meeting and I'm just some random regulator. And here are here are some senators telling me that I'm not doing my job right. And that's an extreme example, but deregulation bills in general work that way, where there's just sort of a sense, whoa, okay, so we're not supposed to be supervising at all. On the second point about the Fed being given too much responsibility, I think that is true in the sense that like we shouldn't have so much power and responsibility concentrated in one institution. But one important thing to note about the Fed is that it has an unlimited operational budget. Mm -hmm. It can spend whatever amount of money that it needs to spend in order to uh, carry out its responsibilities. Um, so uniquely among government agencies, if they are having a difficult time supervising banks, they can hire more people at will. They can hire bill you know, billions of dollars of worth more regulators. And even $500 million can be, every year can be a huge difference at the regulatory level. So I, I ultimately agree that, you know, as I said, I think these supervisory responsibilities should be taken from the Fed. But it should be recognized that um, they have unique ability to get get boots on the ground, really taking these issues seriously, and they do not.